Welcome to Apostolic Archive. We have gathered many wonderful sermons through the years and we have decided to share them with the world. We hope you enjoy. Please subscribe to our channel. Please like the video and comment with something you take away from this message. Also, hit the bell below so you can receive an update as soon as we upload new content. Blessings. Somehow, and now I love him too much to fail him now. All right, I want us to do something now. Now, this is just us here tonight. So I'm going to ask if we could, um, let's move towards the middle and move towards the front, okay? So at least everybody move up one row if you could. Just come on up. I promise I won't. Bite, throw anything. Well, I may throw some things, but I won't bite, I promise. But just come on up, move up just a little bit. Everybody, come on the center. Everybody, come on, don't be afraid. Move on up, move on up, move on up. Come on, come on, come on. It's good for you. Shake up your world a little bit. All right. That's good. I think it's healthy. When we're trying to get closer. Come on up here, Brother Waller. Come on up closer. Y'all, Sister Janice, y'all come on up here. Everybody come on up. I'll, I'll wait for everybody. Come on, Brother Gabe. Come on up here. Uh, y'all wait for me to call your name. Come on, come on, come on. Let's go. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank the Lord. I like that. Very good. Very good. Just good. It feels like we're together. All right. Thank the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. Oh, man, you know how mad people can get when you make a move. I just amaze them. I'm not going to move. Just, for, <laughs> just uh, thank the Lord. Some of you used to be fighting over the front row. If I'd have been Celine Dion, some of y'all would be knocking your neighbor down just to get up close. Amen. I'm not Celine Dion, by the way. All right. Okay. Are y'all ready? Reading tonight from the letter to the Philippians, the church at Philippi, Philippians 4 and verse number 10. Philippians 4 and verse number 10. When you find it, say, I've got it. Amen. Philippians 4 and verse number 10. Philippians 4 and verse number 10. On Sunday mornings uh, here at POK, I've been for the past few weeks dealing with the subject called the good life. Everybody say the good life. Everybody wants the good life. Everybody wants their life to go smooth. And we all in some dark corner of our mind, think that the good life is there if I could just take care of this problem, this issue, get a little bit more money, get the kids in school, get them out of school, get them out of the house, whatever it is, we, we think if I could just reach this point in my life, if I could just retire, if I could just get more money at my job, then I would be living the good life. And uh, we've been dealing with it on Sunday morning. I, my mind has just been stayed on it all week long. So I want to pick up um, this subject again and kind of deal with some things that I, I feel like are tied to living the good life. <clears throat> Philippians 4 and verse number 10. Are you ready to read? Say amen. All right. Are you ready to read? Okay, here we go. Everybody read out loud together. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath forced again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned. Everybody say, he has learned. Say it again. Say, learned. All right. In whatsoever state I am in, or I, I am therewith to be, everybody say content. 
Okay, verse number 12. I know both, and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Verse 13, everybody out loud together. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Amen. I want to entitle this today, Happy Where You Are. Happy, or be happy, right where you are. Be happy where you are. Look at your neighbor and tell them you ought to be happy where you are. All right. Lay your Bibles down and let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the reading of your anointed word. I ask that your word would change us and let it challenge us. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice today. Help us, Jesus, to follow after what your word leads us into. Help us, God, to hear you so that our lives could be fulfilled and we could be a living testimony of your goodness towards us. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. Everybody say amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. (laughs) Praise the Lord. There are many stories in Scripture that I I feel are important. And uh, many uh, miracles of Jesus that I, I continually come back to. Probably one of the most significant, I think, are his first miracles and his last miracles here on earth. And um, the first miracle has always intrigued me. I guess the reason why that the wedding at Cana is so fascinating to me and the miracle of turning the water into wine is because several of the things that happened in the midst of this miracle uh, create questions for me. Uh, and there's so much typology and so much, uh, so many different teachings and messages and, and uh, things that you can teach from Jesus turning the water into wine. You could, you could teach that uh, his first miracle uh, deal, dealt with the baptism of the Holy Ghost because the scripture describes the spirit of God as being like new wine. And how that he starts with the Holy Ghost. And that's how it begins. And then, of course, his last command to the apostles was go tarry in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high, which was the Holy Ghost. So everything starts and finishes with the Holy Ghost. You could teach uh, along the lines of uh, the fact that the miracle was performed at a wedding. And that, that it shows God's value on the wedding ceremony and how important it is uh, that we value and esteem marriage in our society. And, uh, you know, he he performed the first supernatural act at a wedding, showing us that, you know, miracles can take place at weddings. It might be a miracle that you ever have a wedding, but but it is uh, it is important that uh, that that we are, are honoring the institution of marriage. There's a lot of things that the, in this story. I, I think it's important that whenever he looks at the servants, the Bible says that uh, he, he uh, instructs the servants to fill the water pots with water. And at the end of the miracle, no one knew really what the governor of the feast and everyone else was drinking except for the servants. And you could preach or teach the fact that servants always have the inside scoop with the Lord. Servants know things that no one else does, and we ought to be a servant to the Lord. You could preach uh, the fact that the Lord can take ordinary things and make them extraordinary, and that the process of pouring them out is what creates the miracle. He didn't wave his hand over the top of them. He didn't you know, uh, you know, do any kind of, of, of ceremony, but he simply told the servants, You pour it out, and I'll perform the miracle. And the fact is that still today, if we will be willing to pour ourselves out, the process of pouring ourselves out creates miracles and in our life, if you become, uh, you know, uh, a, a inflow with no outflow 
eventually you die. There's no, there's no uh, life in, in being selfish. There's no existence. It, you become a dead sea instead of becoming a river that continually pours out and receives fresh in. And so there's a lot of messages about this wedding miracle that we could teach and preach about. But I guess the miracle or the message miracle uh, that I, I've preached the most is the fact that when, when G- Jesus performs this miracle, it, it, the Bible records the words of the governor of the feast. And we've probably heard them before that Jesus created this wine out of something ordinary and the governor said most people serve uh, the, 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 uh, all of the good wine first. And, uh, and of course, we know that they've run out. And, and uh, he said, but you've done things differently. And, and I, I, I've preached a lot of messages about how that God saves the best for last. And, and, and it'll preach. It's a good message. It's a good idea that we are the fourth runner in a relay and God does the best last. I've uh, used the miracles of Simon Peter. It's a great character study. If you uh, read through the book of Acts and see the miracles that Simon Peter uh, performs and is involved in, you'll see that they're progressive and they just get better and better and better and better. And I've used that as proof that you know, with God, all things just get better and better and better. We sing courses like, it just gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. You, know, you ever sing that? I, all right. So, you know, the, the, the things of God just seem to be better than ever. And the scripture says that, uh, that he has exceeding glory. The Bible re- makes reference to his exceeding glory, his exceeding greatness. In other words, as great as God has been, he's always exceeding his own greatness. The, the greatest time of your life, the greatest miracle that God's performed for you, he's got something better, he's got something that will blow your mind. You have never seen the greatest thing that God can do because the greatest experience you've had, God's got something better. Look at your neighbor and tell him God's got something better for you. That's an encouraging message. But in the middle of this, this message, I, I have quoted this scripture. I've said that the governor of the feast takes this wine and he says, most, uh, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But you have saved the best for last. But that's not what the Bible says. John 2 and verse number nine. Let's read over it if we could. John 2 and verse number nine. The Bible actually says, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until... Amen. I need my next scripture. Until now. No, you, you passed it up. Go on right on back. You were close. Okay, let me try this again. That was my big point. We kind of lost it there. All right, here we go. Are you ready? I've always taught that God saves the best for last. And I've used the governor of the feast, his story. You saved the best for last. But he doesn't say you saved the best for last. We assume that it's last. He says, you've kept the good wine until now, right now. This moment, you have served the best wine. And so what I'm I'm trying to teach tonight is that when you're serving God, sometimes we can look in the future and we can think that things are going to get better and things are going to get brighter. But can I tell you that right now is the best time that you've ever had? Oh, man, that sounds so discouraging. You mean right now is good as it's going to get? Yes, right now is the best 
that it has ever been for you. Well, I have to disagree, Pastor. There's been times in my life that I had less stress and times in my life that I had less trouble. I had more money, less trouble. I had, uh, I had things going a lot smoother at those times. But can I tell you that the trials that you're going through have purpose, they have reason. And you are not on a, a, a perpetual incline, headed up. And, 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 uh, and, and it, the higher you go, the closer you get to God. And when trials come along, it knocks you down. But you're on a flat journey. God's taking you somewhere. And so every part of the journey has purpose, even the trouble parts. Even the times of discouragement have rhyme and reason in your life. Really, they do. And where you are right now is better than where you were yesterday. I know you're waiting for some big wham, but that's it. Where you are is better than where you were yesterday. You know, well, I just can't believe, but pastor, I just failed God miserably. I can't believe I am, I am more backslid than I've ever been. I, I just failed God. I said things I shouldn't have said. I, I failed God morally. And, and, and yesterday I was better off. Let me tell you, I understand the importance of repentance, but that junk that came out this week or that junk that came out last week and surprised you, it was with you two months ago. The Bible says that all evil and murderings and all that stuff, it comes from our heart. And sometimes God takes us through trials in order to bring the junk to the surface. Man, the Bible says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. You got to go through stuff if you want to be blessed. That's why a lot of people aren't blessed is because they don't want to ever endure anything. But God takes us through things, uh, through, through temptations. And that word temptation is the word assay, which literally means to determine what is, is good and precious and what is junk or ore or rock. It's, it's like a, a, an assayer of precious metals. He determines what part is worth keeping and what part is worth throwing away. That's what temptation does for you. It brings the junk out in you. But not just so that you can keep the junk, focus on the junk, uh, you know, obsess over the junk. The reason why it's determined is so you can get rid of the junk and focus on the good. Why is it that we go through trials or maybe even we fail God and God forgives us that we cannot forgive ourselves? We continually go back to the problem and man, we just, we obsess over it. We just think about it and, and, and we just can't believe that, that, that we would put ourselves in that kind of situation or, or maybe we're in the middle of, of a hard time, particularly challenging time and we don't know which direction to go. And by the way, if you don't know which direction to go, sometimes you've got to trust God. We can blame the devil we can blame people, but sometimes God leads us into places where we're trapped. Sometimes God leads us into places that are discouraging. I know y'all don't want to hear that about the Lord. Y'all want to hear him, you know, tiptoeing through the tulips and, you know, whistling and all that stuff. No, sometimes God will take you to tough places. The Bible speaks of Israel and how that Israel uh, comes to the Red Sea. And the scripture in the New Testament actually says that the Lord did not take them by the way of the Philistines lest they see war, repent, and return to Egypt. But he took them by the way of the Red Sea. And, and so God will at times take us into places. When they reached the edge of that water, they were following God. They were obedient to the Lord. They were being led by the Lord. And yet... They found themselves in a situation that was very, very stressful. They, they, they couldn't go forward. They were trapped on all four sides. And there was an enemy coming up from behind them. And, and, and he wasn't coming to, you know, just hang out. They, they were in trouble. They thought they were about to die. And this is why God brought me here? No. No, God brought you here to take care of that stuff. I want to remind you that God set Israel up to be in a stressful situation. 
The Bible says that, that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. I know you think, well, these people that are, they're tormenting me and they're creating all, creating all these problems in my life and I can't believe they're, could it be that it's God that's doing it? Could it be that God is orchestrating a miracle, something bigger than just how people treat you? Could it be that God is trying to work something out so that whenever you reach the other side of this obstacle, you're going to grab a tambourine and say the horse and the rider, God hath thrown into the sea. This wasn't an accident. God set everything up. But we, 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 we tend to re react to everything. And we always respond to troubles and trials with such a morose and, and, and discouraging view of life. Every trial that comes along, like Israel, we say, hey, we should have died back there. We, it was better off in Egypt. I mean, think of how many times did Egypt or did Israel uh, point to Moses and said, it's your fault. You know, the graves in Egypt, they weren't good enough. Here we are, we've seen miracles and we've seen wonders and we've seen signs and all this great stuff that's happened and the first moment of trouble that comes along, they said, die here, die back there, what's the difference? There's a big difference. You're walking with God. God's delivered you. He's brought you through miracle, trial, trouble. He's brought you through a whole lot of valleys. God didn't bring you this far to drop you here. Why do we assume that when we hit a, tr a tough time that, that things are no better here than they were back then? Have, you, have we forgotten the whips? Have we forgotten the bondage that God brought us out of? Have we forgotten how tor terrible and tormenting it was? God brought us out. Thank God. We, we ought to celebrate the fact we're not under bondage anymore. But we are free. Somebody shout, I am free. I am free. I'm not out of bondage. But we tend to look at life in worst case scenario. Everything is the worst case. I've never been this tribe before. I've, I'm, I've never been in this much trouble before. I've never been in, in all of these problems before. I've never faced such obstacles before. And we think it's progressive, that things are continually getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Could it be that's the plan of God? I mean, think about it. Did God have any trouble with the lion? No. Uh, he, he took care of the lion, and then along comes a grizzly bear. Oop, a little bit bigger. And we think, wait a second, God, am I, you gonna, you gonna deliver me from this grizzly bear? And then God deliver, delivers him from that, and then we face Goliath? And Goliath's a little bit bigger than a grizzly bear. My troubles, it's never been this bad. Trials have never, listen, it doesn't matter how big the obstacle is. It doesn't matter how much trouble you're in right now. If God delivered you from a, from a cut on your finger, he can deliver you from cancer. As a matter of fact, we ought to focus on all the miracles in our life. Think back of how many times has God brought us through? How many times has God fed me when I'm hungry? How many times has God given me victory over unbelievable odds? And yet here I am, I'm still standing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm alive today. If, if I'm gonna take out Rocky Balboa, if I'm gonna take out or Mr. T, he's the, he's the good guy. If I'm gonna take out Mr. T, then I've got I've to face a couple of sparring par, uh, partners along the way. There's a reason why they're sparring partners, because they're not good enough to be in the pros. So God takes you through some sparring partners, and we think, oh man, that guy was big, but oh, the next guy's bigger. And so he takes us through somebody bigger, and then out steps Mr. T, trouble. T for trouble. He steps out, and we think, well, this is just too big. Why do you think God allowed you to face the other stuff? To get you ready for this moment so that you wouldn't run and hide and say it's all over? God can't do it? Hey, God is going to bring you through this. God is gonna bring you through this. God is gonna bring you through this. Trust him. 
Just trust him. Trust the Lord. We got to learn to trust God in our life. And, and so God doesn't save the best for some unreachable, unattainable last. God saves the best for right where you are right now. Where you're living is the best place for you to be right now. Because God's trying to do something. Nothing happens by accident with God. Amen. Now, I'm going I'm to get a little ahead of myself. But the Bible says that all things work together for the good of them to, whom, uh, to, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All things work together. All things. That means the good, the bad. All of it works together for my good. Everybody say, my good. So you're facing trials right now. Good. So you're going through valleys right now. Good. It's so so, so you're, you're in the middle of trouble and you don't know which way to go. Good. Because the same pronouncement of, of good is, is, the, is, is the same pronouncement of good that you ought to give your life when you're on the mountaintop. Because the God that led you to the mountaintop also leads you through valleys. It doesn't matter where God's leading you as long as God is leading you. The win in life is not where you are. It's that God shows up at the wedding feast. Stop and celebrate the fact he's here. Doesn't matter that we've run out of wine. Doesn't matter that I've got to get a new job. Doesn't matter that, that, that I've got bills to pay and the, you know they're stacking up. I don't know what to do. Just celebrate the fact I have been faithful to God for another year. Here I am. People said you wouldn't make it. They said you wouldn't last. But here you are still serving the Lord. You ought to celebrate. It is good to be here. It's good to be here. It's good to be here. It's good to be serving God. What an amazing blessing we have in living for the Lord. It's just amazing. You know, there, there are people that we can go to work for and they'll pay us well. And, uh, you know, they may be the best employers. I don't know who Fortune 500 say is the, uh, are the best companies to work for. But at the end of the day, you may have one or two caring uh, employers but those caring employers do not know the intimate details of your mind and your heart. And they may give you a little bonus and slide you some cash. They may give you the overtime that you need and they may help you here and there. But in the end, they're, they're going on with their lives. Consider that we serve a God who cares about the little details of our lives. I preached a message a few weeks ago about, about the sparrows. And if he cares about every sparrow that falls, that smallest unwanted little uh, uh, fifth sparrow, that, that little sparrow that nobody else cared about, if the Lord cared about that one, how much more does he care about every little thing that's going on in your life? And unlike your employer who's treated you well, God is able to provide funds. He's able to provide encouragement. He knows everything you go through. He knows every battle, every, everything you face. He knows you. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're thinking. And he loves you. We've got to learn to trust in the Lord. You know, that, that journey across the wilderness, it wasn't a direct line. And, and if you've ever looked in the back of your Bible, You'll see the circlings of the, uh, the, the exodus from, from Egypt all the way to the promised land. They finally get close and they have to turn around. And, 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 and it, it's a confusing journey. Just it wasn't a direct shot across the wilderness. And yet, all the time they were journeying, they were following after the will of God. They are being led by the Lord. Every step that they took, God was leading them. But God was leading them in circles. God's plan isn't our plan. And God's way of advancing in life and having a successful life, it doesn't really uh, play out with our definition of a successful life. We, we have got to learn that, to trust that God wants 
to take us somewhere. And, 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 and of course, I understand that, that the reason why he took them in those circles and the reason why he took them to those specific places in the wilderness to confront this issue and that issue and have this come up and, and, and take care of this, the reason why he did it was to change and mature them. The minute that he took care of them and got their attitude right, it was no trouble giving them the promise. He took them in, marched them around the walls. They let out a shout of victory and, and the walls came down. It, it's no problem for God to provide those things in your life that you feel like you need. But God is more concerned about you. He's more concerned about your spirit, your attitude. Your nature in the middle of trouble. Your trust in God. He's more concerned about how you respond to trouble than he is about you driving a nicer car. The minute that God fixes that stuff in our life is the moment that he'll, he'll give us what we need. But we've got to learn how to trust him. And instead of facing these, these, uh, these bigger and, 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 and badder uh, trials and, and, and the enemies get bigger, and instead of us complaining about it, we ought, to, we ought to have a peace in our heart. Just trust that God's going to work this out. I want everybody to, 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 to repeat after me. God is going to work it out. Say this, say, it's all going to be okay. Look at your neighbor and tell him, it's all going to be okay. God's going to take care of it. Say it. God's going to take care of it. Tell him, it's going to work out for my good. Why is it that we believe the opposite? Why is it that we naturally default to the worst thing in our life? But God is trying to give us that life that, that, that we've always dreamed of and give us that that desire and, that, uh, and, and, uh, and, and just give us peace in our life. But even when you have peace, it doesn't mean you're going to have a problem-free world. But it, it's going to be that you just learn how to trust him. Learn how to just ride out the storm. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. You're, you're going to have times that you will, will be trying to do right, and yet you're going to fail. But God is merciful. He loves you. He'll pick you up again. We've got to stop imagining that God will divorce us the minute that we fail. It's not a license to fail. It's not a permission to go out and sin. But if you do fail, you have got an advocate. Think about that. Jesus, the Bible calls Jesus our advocate. He's a lawyer. That's, everybody say, Jesus, Jesus. is my lawyer. Now, why do we think Jesus is our judge? Well, he'll be a judge one day, but he's not the judge yet. Right now, he is our lawyer. He's our advocate. He is my personal attorney. Which means, Brother Chuck, I've never really had a need for an attorney uh, in, in some, like some of you have. Uh, but I've got to be careful. Uh, but, but... You know, I, I do know the role, and I have been sitting in, in traffic court before, and uh, just to be a console somebody else that was there, I'm sure. But I have been there, and I've seen, I've seen men walk in with lawyers. You know what, the, what uh, most attorneys will, will tell their clients? You just keep your mouth shut. What would happen if the church ever learned to just keep their mouth shut? When they're in trouble. And then the attorney will say, I'm going to tell you what to say. And this is what you better say. This is all you say. You don't say anything else. You say this. You speak this. The attorney will tell him what to say. Now, uh, if, if you want to, you know, if, if, if you want to be really foolish, you'll ignore the advice of your attorney. And you'll just start talking. And you'll say whatever you want to say. And the judge will stop you and say, son, you got an attorney. Why don't you let him deal with it? Why don't you let him talk? You have got an attorney. You've got somebody that you can sit back and let him argue for you. For you. Not against you. For you. The Bible does not say that you have got a prosecutor. It says you've got an advocate. 
The prosecutor is the enemy. But you've got somebody that will go to war for you. When we go through trials, if we could ever get control of our tongue and learn how to trust God and start speaking exactly what our lawyer tells us to speak. Instead of just blah, 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 blah. And we're in the pokey three or four days later. We don't know what happened. Somebody get me a harmonica. How did I get here? How did things get so bad? You didn't shut your mouth. Speak what your attorney told you to speak. We've got to learn how to trust God. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, look at uh, the gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke. And verse number... Um, Let's see, Gospel of Luke, and we will begin reading in verse number 28. The Gospel of Luke, in verse number 28. This is what it says. And it came to pass, about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. Glisten, glistering. And behold, there were talk with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he, he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, watch this, verse 32. This is funny. But when Peter and they that were with him um, were heavy with sleep, but Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, <clears throat> and when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass as they departed from him. Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. Everybody say, he didn't know what he was talking about. That's, that's a fancy scriptural way of saying he didn't have a clue. Simon Peter did not have a clue. Now notice, that, why, why do you think that he wanted to build three tabernacles? Because he thought this moment is so powerful. This moment is amazing. This moment is awesome. Let's build three tabernacles. And I, if, if I were there, now I'm not, but if I were there, I would just raise my hand and say, excuse me, Simon Peter, this moment is so powerful that you guys were just asleep. Excuse me, this moment is so dynamic, awesome. You guys were asleep a few minutes ago. Now, granted that, yes, it is a powerful moment. And I'm not trying to downplay that. It was amazing that, you know, Jesus would speak with Moses and with Elijah. But watch what Simon Peter does. He says, this moment is an amazing moment. Let's build three tabernacles. Let's camp right here on this mountaintop. And, and yet, Jesus leads them off of the mountaintop. He takes them down. Doesn't acknowledge the whole building program. Let's set up camp here. This is an amazing moment. What Simon Peter didn't know and didn't understand was that that moment was no more powerful than the next few verses or the moment before. It was no more powerful than whenever he's asking the question, whom do men say that I am? It's no more powerful than when he fed the 5,000. The fact is, the same Jesus that was on Mount Transfiguration would lead them back down when the glory would fade. He was with them. But often we want to build monuments to moments in our life. And we want to say, now this moment is awesome. What would have happened if Jesus walked off that mountain and Simon Peter said, hey, God, hey, hey Jesus, well, you know, we're going to stay right here. This is such an amazing place. We'll see you later. And left Jesus. They wouldn't have been there to see and hear Jesus talk about the kingdom of God. They would have never heard Jesus prophesy and talk about receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. They would have missed all of that if they got caught up 
in the moment. If they stayed on the mountaintop, built their three tabernacles there, they were so caught up in that moment, they didn't realize every moment with Jesus is awesome. Now, now that's a good example of camping out at a moment. But why is it that people do the same things with bad moments? We say, I don't ever want to go to that place again. That was an awful place. Or where I am right now, it's horrible. Just get me out of this moment. When the truth is, this moment is just as good as your Mount Transfiguration moment. If Jesus is with you. We've got to learn how to trust God. And that if the Lord is with you, it, it doesn't matter if you're eating caviar or cat food out of a can. If, if God is with you, you ought to celebrate that moment. It's good to be here. Sitting in, in a gutter, it's good to be here. Why? Jesus is with me. I, listen, you know, I'm, I'm digging through the trash can looking for new shoes, a new pair of shoes. But it's good to be here because Jesus is with me. Somebody say, Jesus is with me. It's so easy to get caught up in a moment. But the Lord is trying to teach us, trying to get us to understand that every moment with him is a good moment. Don't allow our, your flesh or this world to take you on such high highs and low lows. That, that you're constantly, it's, you know, it's kind of like being perpetually in ski season. Just I'm down at the bottom of the hill. But I go to the top of the hill, and the purpose of going to the top of the hill, the reason why I go up there is to come down. The reason why I come down is to go back up again. And the faster I go up, the quicker I can come down. And we're on this constant up and down and up and down. And we don't enjoy the journey. I remember years ago, we were, when I first uh, tried to ski, I, would, uh, I wasn't really accurate, but I was very fast. Any sport that involves me falling uh, is pretty much, I'm good at it, all right? So I, uh, but I, I remember being, uh, trying to learn how to ski. And, and, um, and so, you know, I, 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 I had seen, you know, um, I'd seen enough movies to know that you just put your skis together and, and just kind of stay on your feet. And you hold these things out to the side. And so friends of mine and I, we showed up to ski, um, Resort, and they said everybody's going to take lessons. And we said, "Come on, lessons! I mean, I, I'm a secret agent. I can fire a machine gun from my skis." And and uh, and so you know, um, and and so you know, I, I I just knew what I was doing. I was you know, um, I, I I knew kind of. We just knew me and my buddy Dusty. We just we had it together. And so I remember we were looking at those ski lifts and trying to decide which one. We wanted to go down. And so we looked and there was one, there was actually two in front of us. And, and one was a, 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 it had a little green triangle on it. And, and, we, and but, but there were just a bunch of kids on that. And, you know, we didn't want to play kid games. And this is, we're men here. We, you know, we're ready for some challenge. And then we looked over at the other one that wasn't quite so busy. And it had a couple of blocks on it, little black triangles on it. And we thought, well, now that's the one for us. Nobody's up there. Let's try that one. And, and so me and my friend, we, we got on that ski lift and we rode and rode and rode. And, and uh, there were some older folks behind us and saying, you know, you, uh, you guys ski up here a lot. We're a little nervous. And we were, you know, we just said, oh, this is no big deal. And we're trying to talk. There, these people behind us, they were so worried. We were such a comfort to them. We, I remember turning around that first trip up the mountain and saying, you guys, y'all just relax. It's going to be okay. It's, it just looks really steep, but it's not that bad. And this older couple, they were, thank you so much. Are you sure we can make it? Oh, yes, we're sure that you can make it. Don't you worry. We didn't tell them that we had never worn skis until the very bottom of the lift. And, and so... We were just comforting them and they were, thank you, thank you so much. And they were saying things like, we just, well, why don't you stay close to us? And, you know, y'all, y'all. And so we said, hey, we'll take care of it. And uh, here came the top of the ski lift and, and we were so excited. Here, we, here it goes. And, and so I looked at my friend. I said, man, you ready? I'm ready. Here we go. And uh, I turned to those people behind us and said, oh, y'all ready? Y'all follow us. And with that, both me and my friend Dusty did a nose plant right down at the base of the chair. And uh, that older couple kind of skied around us, and we never heard from them again. They just kept going. They didn't even wait for us. And so, <laughs> a 
it took us almost three hours to get down the mountain. Um, we, had, we were on a treasure hunt searching for things like skis and poles and quite a bit of the time. Uh, a couple of limbs. Uh, but <clears throat> the point that I'm making is that after a while we realize, you know, that we're so, we're so consumed with getting up to the top that we, we never took the time to enjoy the beauty of a green slope. It's beautiful. <laughs> that green little triangle is so beautiful now. And we, we, we didn't want process. We wanted just to just go for the, go for the best, the biggest. And, and, uh, and, 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 and God, God wants us to enjoy this journey. That's why when the disciples would be beaten, commanded not to preach the gospel, they would walk out of the jail cell rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. I know that sounds foreign to us because we live in a life of good and mushy and squishy and, and just everything's ought to be just all rosy and Oreos, man, just nothing but good stuff. But the truth is, we, you know, we're, we're going to have trials. But when we face trials, it's not like anybody else facing trials. That's why, that's why the Bible says, take no thought for where you're going to eat and where you're going to sleep. And, and don't worry about all the needs that you have in your life. He, he said, all, all of those things that you're seeking for, that's what the Gentiles seek after. As in, those that are not in covenant. Now, I know we're all Gentiles now, but we have been grafted into the vine. Some of you are so stressed out about stuff and this. I got to take care of this and this. And the same message that he gave them is the same message that he's given you today. Take note all the, that, that's what the unbeliever stresses out over. That's what people do that don't have God. Stress and worry and anxiety and all that. That's what folks that don't have the Holy Ghost do. Go through stress and anxiety. You don't have to do that. God knows what you have need of. Either we believe it or we don't. We ought to believe it. God has been good to us. It allows us into his kingdom. Now, I'm going to give you this in closing. Romans chapter 12, if you have it. <clears throat> and verse number, um, well, we're going to read. Let's look at a few of these verses out of this. Romans, the 12th chapter. Ver the first part of, of chapter 12, uh, Paul's telling the church of Rome, uh, he's talking to them about the importance of holiness in making their lives a living sacrifice. And, and he, then he starts dealing with uh, their testimony. Be, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of their mind. Talking a, a lot about them, how they should act and how, how they ought to live. And there's, the purpose for it is ministry. He's saying the reason why you ought to live this way is so that you can reach other people. God wants us to be a witness. He wants us to, to be a light in a dark world. But whenever we become the end user, whenever it becomes all about us, we're going to get caught up with, with law. We're going to say, do I have to do it? You know, all, all of that stuff that we, we've talked about before in, 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 in relation to holiness. Whenever, whenever everything starts and stops with me, then yeah, we, we struggle. But when it ceases to be about me, when it becomes about a lost world, we ought to be a light to a lost world. Folks ought to recognize us. We are the light of the world. God put the light in us. Look at the person beside you and tell them, I am the light. But I'm not the light, so I can, you know, just admire my own beauty, flitter around, you know, the house like a little... Lightning bug and just show off the light. Here I am. Woo, I'm light. I'm bright. God didn't do that. He gave you that light so that you could be a witness to the world. He wanted you. And, and so uh, that's the purpose of all this is ministry. God cares about what people see when they look at you. And so sometimes God will take us through things that have nothing whatsoever to do with us. He'll take us through troubles. And, and, and we don't understand, God, why would you take this after you gave me this promise and you did this in my life and you took me through this mountain and this valley? Why would you bring me here? 
I don't understand it, God. Could it be that it has nothing to do with you? And that it's God trying to use you to reach somebody else? You know, sometimes the Spirit of God will shut doors for you. And you don't understand it. Like the Apostle Paul, we're trying to do ministry. Trying to do it and door shuts, another door shuts, another door shuts. But there's a man, a jailer in Macedonia that he's trying to reach. And if he doesn't shut some doors for you, you're going to be a million miles away from where you can reach this man. Sometimes it's not about you. You're the light of the world. God's trying to take you to strategic places so that he can use you for his kingdom. So when you go through trouble, you ought to, don't, don't stress out about it. It's not about you. God brought you to this point. He's going to take you out of this point. That's right. God's going to bring you through it. He's going to take you out. There's a reason. There's a purpose for every place that you go. Every valley that you go through, there's a reason for it. And we've got to trust the Lord. And so, <clears throat> sometimes you're going to be betrayed. It may not be about you. Sometimes people are going to lie about you. It may not be about you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean you've lost the favor of God in your life. It doesn't mean that it cancels out your dream, Joseph. It could be that God is, is trying to position you right next to one jailmate at the lowest point of what you think is your life. He's trying to put you up rubbing shoulders with somebody that's about to go to the king's palace. When God gets ready to bring you out, it doesn't take him long. We've got to learn how to trust the Lord and not give up. Stop giving in. Stop saying it's all over. God has forsaken me. You know, when, when Demas forsook the apostle Paul and the, the struggle that he had getting over, over that. And, and, and even John Mark, whenever he forsook uh, the, the apostle because of the journey got difficult. The Bible really doesn't say why, but apparently it was over the journey uh, because of the response of the apostle Paul later when Barnabas wanted to bring him in. And, and he had a real tough time with the missionary journey, but he gave up. And when he gave up, he thought, I'll just go back to my old life. It's too tough out here. I'll just give up. I'll just walk away. I'll, my life was so much better back over there in Egypt. And so he turns and he walks back thinking, my life is about to get better because I'm away from the trying situation. And yet, years pass. Time passes. And yet God starts, it doesn't go away. God's dealing with John Mark. Guess where John Mark is? Years later, he shows up right back in the same place on the mission field. He didn't get away from anything. God was taking him to that point for a reason. God took him there. Yeah, there were people that didn't want to work with him anymore, like, like Paul. And, and, and God had to eventually deal with Paul's heart, and he changed him. And, and eventually, you know, there would be reconciliation and and, and Paul would, would request him by name when he was in prison. And, and so, but, but John Mark left because of the trouble. He quit because of the trouble. And finally, he gets his heart right and God takes him and says, okay, now, two or three years later, all right, here we go. Let's pick up where we left off. You don't quit, God. <laughs> God, God has a reason for taking you where he's taking you. Just trust him. God is a good God. You can trust the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. And so in, in the book of, of Romans 12, it, it deals a lot with ministry. After he's talking about the importance of being a light and, and uh, you know, being a witness, then he's, he, he goes into this big, long discourse about ministry and how that you ought to love other people. And, and then... Then he, at, at the end of this chapter, he goes back to this whole relationship thing. If you look at, back at, uh, um, uh, it, 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 at verse number four, he's dealing with members in the body. Because uh, may, maybe not here in this church, but in other churches, other times, there's arguments among members of the church. Not here, I know. Everybody here loves each other, never have any trouble. But 
But in this day, they had trouble. And, and, and so he's dealing with, with ministry. And he says in verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cling to that which is good. He's not dealing with just right and wrong. But he's talking about people. We got to learn how to cleave to things that are good about people. It's possible to hate bad stuff, but love the good in people. Look for the good in people. Cleave to the good in people. And then verse number 21. This is how, actually verse 20, he's talking about enemies. And, and this is how you ought to treat your enemy. Uh, feed them. If you thirst, give them to drink. If you want to know the way to, to get even with your enemy, is treat them, treat them good. If you really want to torment them and, you know, get back at them, first of all, that's vengeance. I've never seen anybody ever argued into a change. Ever. Have you? Have you ever seen somebody, I'll tell you another thing, you're this and you're that and you're that. And, and both of them are arguing. And they're arguing back and forth. And finally, one of them says, well, I believe you're right. I am that way and I'll change. And they storm off a transformed individual. Somebody's got to come down. Somebody's got to be meek. And it doesn't happen really often when the argument's going on. And tempers are flared. It happens when everything calms down and people are talking reasonable. And so if you want to change people, reward evil with good. And then verse 21, it says this. It says, be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. You're facing evil right now? Do some good. Overcome it. Don't reward it with more evil. If you want to break free from oppression, you ought to just be a worshiper. Do something good. Don't respond negatively to that. Some of us go through trial and we just want to give up on the church and walk away. Well, I hit, I hit a roadblock and I just, I give up. And we reward evil with more evil, thinking that that extra evil, like John Mark, if I just forsake the Lord, I'm facing trials right now, my answer is to forsake the Lord. Thinking that's going to make their life better, but it didn't. If his life would have been much better, he would have never ended up doing the same thing that he was doing when he quit years later. So God takes us through trials, and we got to learn how to trust him. Don't quit. Everybody say, don't quit. All right. But do good. Stop waiting until you feel better. Worship God. Be a worshiper of God. Worshipers are always encouraged. I'm not talking about folks that are just worshiping every once in a while, that know how to come to church and you know, clap their hands when everybody else is clapping. But I'm, I'm talking about those that really worship God and wor know how to worship God when everything in their life is falling apart. We've, that's how we overcome evil with good is to start worshiping the Lord. All right. Let's, uh, musicians, please come. Let's, let's close this out. <clears throat> Paul said in 2 Corinthians uh, 4 in verse number 17, it says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We assume that every bit of reward that we get is going to be our eternal reward. It's, it's all about eternity. If I just suffer here, then by and by, when the morning comes, all the saints in, of God are gathered home. In that moment, then everything's going to be better, and that's when I'm going to live the good life. And so we really don't like to suffer. We want the good life right here. Can I tell you that if you will do what the Word of God tells you to do, you'll have the good life here too. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go through trouble. But when you face trouble, the trouble's not your trouble. It's God's trouble. If you'll stay in the fight, if you'll continue to serve the Lord, let the Lord walk with you. All right. In, in Malachi, if we could all stand. In Malachi, the book of Malachi, the very last 
chapter in the Old Testament. Anytime we read it, people get nervous and start hanging onto their wallet because it speaks of tithing and giving of offerings and robbing God and all of that. But it actually begins with God telling Israel that they're offering worship that's blind worship, lame worship. He said, You're, I have no desire for your crippled up lame offerings and 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 uh you know it's blind you're bringing me uh, blind sacrifices you're bringing me sick sacrifices and and you expect me to reward you and this is what you're bringing me it's blind and and god god loves us and 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 we all know that but When we give things to God and we call it worship, sometimes we need to take a good look at what we're offering God. We give things to God that we would be embarrassed to give a politician. I'm not saying that that's all politicians are bad. But we we, we would be embarrassed to give anybody sometimes what we give to God. And so we give it thinking, well, God's going to honor it. And God does bless us. But we come to church and we go through the same motions and we wonder, why isn't God honoring? Why are are we being blessed? Because all the worship we're giving him is just half-hearted. Hallelujah. We only lift our hands when everybody else lifts their hands. We only clap when everybody else is doing it. The only time we come to the altar is when we're forced to or we feel like we got to pray through. It's like pulling teeth to get some people to come to the altar. I don't know what on earth the altar ever did to some of us to offend you so bad. I, don't, I just don't do that. That's the problem. You don't do that. Start doing it and you'll feel better. Listen, when we come to God and we offer him half-hearted sacrifices, then the blessings of God are never going to exist in our life like we really want them. But if we come to the, to the throne and, and, and give God something more than just blind and halt and crippled sacrifices, God is going to give us a whole lot more than just blind and crippled reward. You know, <clears throat> in, in the book of Malachi, the Lord is basically saying, how dare you offer me that blind praise? You ought to get a vision for what you're doing. The reason why you're bringing those lambs isn't just to fulfill your responsibility. You didn't bring that lamb just so you could get access to the court. There's a holy of holies. And I'm, I'm trying to get the blood of that lamb to that holy of holies. I'm trying to get you back in right standing with God. Our worship is all about getting us in right standing with God. When we come to church, the reason why the preacher always seems like a cheerleader, come on, let's pray. Come on, everybody raise your hand. Come on, everybody pray. Everybody come to the altar. The reason why he's doing that is not just to generate some sort of a Holy Ghost hoedown and have a wild church. but, But the reason why... We do that is because our sacrifice of praise gets each of us back in right standing with God. And when you're in right standing with God, God will bless you. He'll walk with you. When you face a trial, you're going to feel his presence and you're going to know that he's with you. Amen. It's it's bigger than that moment. It's bigger than just saying, well, I I raised my hands, preacher. Did you really? Worship, though? Come on, did you really get a breakthrough? Or I don't know why the pastor's always getting on to me. I came to church, didn't I? Well, yeah, you came to church. That's good. You're going to be blessed because of it. But listen, there's more to living for God than just doing your obligation. There is a better life, a life of fulfillment. Now, if your life is great right now and you're happy with what everything's going on, fine. But I got to feeling there's a few John Marks out here 
they're thinking that my best option is just to stay in the back, just stay away from the fray. God is trying to get you to live an overcoming life. If we will just continue to worship God, eventually we'll make it beyond the veil. God will reveal himself to us like we've never, never seen him before. How many want that? Amen. How many want right standing with the Lord? If you want right standing with God, I'm going to give you a, mo a, a moment here to pray. I I'm asking if you want to be in right standing with God to step out into the aisle and make your way to the front. Now, if you don't... You if you don't want to be right with God, you sit right where you are. You stand right where you are. But if you want to be right with God, oh, come on, come on. Just take that, that step. Take that step and say, God, I'm going to give you my all. I'm going to give you my everything. Come on, make that move. Come on, make that move towards God. Hallelujah. Come on, get serious with God. Come on in close so everybody can come in. Amen, amen. Come on in, come on in. If you're standing in the aisle, come on up close. Allow everybody to come in. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, I want a closer walk with you. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm tired of living life in the middle of trials and trouble. Help me, Lord, God, to trust you. Lord, help me to have, have faith that you're not bringing me through these problems on accident, but God, there's a purpose behind it all. Lord, I want to learn to trust you. I, I want to encourage somebody today that feels as though God has forgotten about you. He knows exactly who you are and where you are. You're where you are for a reason. There's a purpose. You may not understand it, but you got to trust him. Hallelujah. Come on. Just call out to make your commitment to him right now. Lord, it doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't matter if you deliver me from this fiery furnace or not. I'm still going to trust you. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to be into this world. I'm not going to bow to this world. I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm going to keep walking. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that you love me. So glad that you care about me. I want to love Hallelujah Thank you Jesus Why don't you lift your hands now Come on, surrender it to God God I give it all to you That's it, just lift your hands to the Lord God I surrender Oh yes Lord I want to live I want to live The way The way I want to give, I want to give until, until there's just no more to give. Lord, I want to enjoy this journey that I'm on. Lord, I don't want to be miserable, God. I want to enjoy the journey.